Welcome to Cinematic Excrement and my ongoing and seemingly never-ending quest to review every single one of those goddamn Razzie Worst Picture winners. Oh, boy. I'm sorry if I seem a bit out of it right now, but these last couple years' worth of Razzie movies have just been painfully bad. And I think they may be starting to take their toll. I mean, I said 2007 was a banner year for shit, and I meant it, but 2008 might actually be worse. It was also a landmark year in the history of this very silly YouTube show, as 2008 brought us the first movie I ever reviewed. Twilight. My god, has it really been that long. I don't know what I can say about the Twilight Saga that I haven't said already, it changed the world for better or worse. Maybe a bit of both. And would you believe Twilight wasn't nominated for a single Razzie? I'm not kidding, I checked. And at first, I thought that was a serious mistake. It wouldn't be the first time the Razzies overlooked an obvious choice. <clears throat> but after looking at the movies that were nominated that year, honestly, I think I get it. Twilight is a bad movie. I said that years ago and I stand by it. But I've seen worse movies from 2008. For example, The Love Guru. Around this time, Mike Myers was riding high thanks to the tremendous success of the Austin Powers and Shrek franchises, which had three movies apiece at the time. But I think most would agree the third movie in each series was a step down from the previous two. And if that wasn't an indication that his career had peaked, Myers certainly made that clear when he co-wrote, co-produced, and starred in The Love Guru. To date, it is the only directorial credit for Marco Schnabel. I wonder why. It was poorly received by critics and the movie going public, making about $40 million against a $62 million budget. It was not Meyer's first box office bomb, mind you, but it was the one where he had the most creative control. So he's got no one to blame but himself. Myers plays the titular love guru Maurice Pitka, a character who was originally planned for the second Austin Powers movie but was ultimately shelved probably should have stayed that way. Pitka is the number two guru in the world behind real-life New Age guru and pseudoscience peddler Deepak Chopra, a longtime friend of Myers. Believe it or not, Chopra initially defended the movie before it was released, stating Myers, quote, has the most profound understanding of Eastern wisdom, traditions, and spirituality. Oh my god, he actually said that. And his critics were hastily judging the movie based on the trailer, had no sense of humor, and were projecting their insecurities with their own spiritual beliefs. Then the movie hit theaters, and people actually saw it. And Chopra got very quiet for a few weeks. When he finally broke his silence, he came clean and admitted the movie sucked, stating Myers relied far too heavily on grossing the audience out and wasn't funny enough with his spiritual themes. Humor mixed with spirituality can work if it's done well, but frankly speaking, this was not a good attempt. That's an understatement. Well, let's see just why this was not a good attempt. Our story begins in the Indian village of Heron McKeister. Wow. Wow. I know I often say things like, we're only two minutes in and already I hate this movie. It's a joke I've probably overused, if I'm being honest, but this, this has to be a new record. This is the first shot and already I hate this movie. Good Lord. And no, of course this isn't the only time they use the lazy-ass Indian name sound funny gag as we are later introduced to Pitka's teacher, a cross-eyed Ben Kingsley as Guru Tuggan Maputta, and the Indian martial art known as How to Hurt a Guy. And instead of the traditional Hindu greeting Namaste, they use the fake Hindu greeting Marishka Hargate. No, really. Marishka Hargate, your holiness. Marishka Hargate. She's Hungarian! That joke doesn't even work! This is made even more bizarre by a cameo from the real Mariska Hargate. Yes, this is actually happening. I mean, good that she's in on the joke, I guess. And she stated in an interview that she was mostly happy people were pronouncing her name correctly for once, so there's that. 
But what really gets me is this cameo comes about seven minutes into the movie, and they keep using Mariska Hargitay as a greeting afterwards. So basically, they do the setup and the payoff, and then just keep the joke going for another hour and change. Hey Mike, that's not how jokes work. Most of the jokes in this movie don't work, in fact. For example, during the opening musical number where Pitka sings 9 to 5, and shockingly, this is one of the better parts of the movie, we see an elephant with a bumper sticker on its ass that reads, Cash, gas, or ass, no one rides for free. I can't believe I have to explain this, but that's not how the saying goes. It's ass, gas, or grass. And gas in this case means money with which the driver can buy gas, so cash and gas are the same thing! How do you screw up such a simple joke? Would that one drug reference have really pushed you into an R rating? And if so, if you can't make the joke work, come up with a new joke! But while this joke doesn't work, at least it is a joke. Despite this movie allegedly being a comedy, it is very low on actual jokes. Most of its so-called humor comes from one of three sources. One, Indian names sound funny. Two, Vern Troyer is short, just in case you hadn't noticed. I'd like to thank the Academy. Wow, these things are heavy. And three, Myers trying to gross the audience out, and usually succeeding. For example, there's a bit where... <sighs> Guru Tuggin Maputa pours a cup of tea through his nose. Why? I don't know, and I don't think Myers does either. And then he has his students fight with piss-soaked mops because... reasons. And there's the obligatory fart joke, of course. And Pitka shoves his head up his own ass. If that's not a metaphor for this movie, I don't know what is. And then there's... Elephants having sex. I got nothing. I mean, what am I supposed to say to that? Elephants having sex. There's no joke there. And indeed, that's the problem. There's no joke there. Anyway, Maurice Pitka was orphaned as a child and somehow came to live with Deepak Chopra and Guru... T uh, no, I'm not saying his character's name again. He's Guru Ben Kingsley. And oh my god, what in the uncanny fuck is this? Why did they paste Meyer's head onto a child's body? The kid playing Deepak has a normal face. Why couldn't they have done the same for this kid? This isn't funny. It's just creepy. And what is Kingsley even doing here? He's way too good for this movie. I appreciate his role in Shang-Chi even more now. At least in that movie, he was actually funny. Here, he's just... weird. In fact, there are several people in this movie who should be doing better things. Morgan Freeman, though he only provides a voiceover and doesn't appear on camera, Jim Gaffigan, Stephen Colbert, John Oliver, Vern Troyer, Daniel Tosh... Actually, I take that back. Daniel Tosh is not too good for this movie. He belongs here. In hell. Moving on, Pitka and Chopra grew up as rivals, and Pitka has long wanted to overtake Chopra as the number one love guru, but has been unable to do so. What does Deepak Chopra have that I don't have? A real accent? I still have not figured out exactly what Myers was trying to do with this accent. It's vaguely Indian, but I've met plenty of Indian people and none of them sound like this. They certainly don't pronounce the word can't the way he does. If you can love yourself, you can love another. I'm sorry, what was that? If you can love yourself, you can love another. You hear it too, right? Anyway, fate has presented Pitka and his terrible accent with an interesting opportunity. The star player of the Toronto Maple Leafs, Darren Roanoke, played by Romani Malco, recently split from his wife, Prudence, played by Megan Good. And Prudence is now dating rival hockey player Jacques Lecoq Grande, a French-Canadian with a Spanish last name for some reason, played by Justin Timberlake of all people. And I'll give you three guesses what Lecoq's defining physical characteristic is. Holy f and his accent is no better than Myers, let me tell you. But at least he can pronounce can't. 
And since all this went down, Roanoke has been playing like absolute shit. So team owner Jane Bullard and coach Punch Cherkov, played respectively by Jessica Alba and the late Vern Troyer, have hired Guru Pitka to fix his marriage so he can get his hockey skills back and win Toronto their first Stanley Cup in 40 years. If Guru Pitka can pull it off, he'll score $2 million and an appearance on Oprah. Well, on paper, that doesn't sound like a terrible premise. There's just one problem. The movie makes it clear that Roanoke split from his wife before the playoffs began. And by the time Pitka takes the job, they're in the Stanley Cup Finals. So, what exactly is the problem here? Can the Leafs win without Roanoke? Well, clearly they have been for three rounds. I could maybe see this working if Pitka came into the picture while the team was in a mid-season slump and he helped Roanoke get his confidence back and they turned things around and, despite all expectations, made the finals. Sort of like Angels in the Outfield, except with fewer Angels and more terrible accents. But they're already in the finals! Why do they need to spend two million dollars on this bearded idiot? Bench Roanoke, send Pitka packing, and move on! In any case, Pitka proceeds to dish out terrible advice to Roanoke on how to handle his issues with his wife and his overbearing mother, played by Thelma Hopkins. Subtle movie. Very subtle. And I'm sure someone thought this character was funny, but really, she's just disturbing. She's clearly an abusive trash bag who should be locked up. Oh, I know you are not trying to tell me how to raise my child. Raise your child? Bitch, he's 40! And while Pitka tries and mostly fails to help Roanoke, he also has a budding romance with Jane. Somehow. But their relationship is a bit tricky for two reasons. First, Jane is convinced her family is cursed, as the Maple Leafs haven't won a title since her father bought the team in 1967. And this curse somehow prevents her from finding a good man. And second, Pitka was forced to wear a chastity belt by Guru Ben Kingsley because... Well, it's not really clear, actually. Nor is it clear how he manages to keep everything clean down there. I mean, has he just been peeing on himself for the last 30 years? Well, he might as well remove that belt, because I'm sure an infection set in long ago and his dick has already rotted away and fallen off. I do not apologize for that visual. I am suffering and you will suffer with me! The chastity belt also makes this scene confusing. What's your capital Thailand? Bangkok? Exactly! How exactly did punching a metal chastity belt only hurt Pitka and not the coach? And that's not even a good pun. Anyway, I'm sure you can guess where this all heads. Eventually, Roanoke learns how to stand up to his mother, reunites with his wife, and wins the Stanley Cup in Game 7 with a last-second penalty goal over Grande because how else would it end? Pitka and Jane finally get past their own insecurities and are ready to be a couple, leading to the only funny joke in the movie where Kingsley reveals the chastity belt was never actually locked and could have been removed at any time. There's a snap in the back. We get some last-second cameos from the real Deepak Chopra and, confusingly, Mike Myers as himself alongside Kanye West. Because that's something we all needed to be reminded of. And they do a Bollywood dance number and live happily ever after the end. That's the love guru. It's fucking horrible. Considering the talent involved, this movie should be so much funnier than it is. And yet this so-called comedy is almost an hour and a half long and has exactly one good joke. One. That's embarrassing. I'm actually embarrassed for the people who made this movie. And a lot of the comedy is too stupid for adults, but also too vulgar for kids. Myers has had that problem before. And I don't know if I'm necessarily qualified to say if this movie is offensive to people of Indian descent, but it's definitely offensive to people with good taste. And I didn't cover every terrible joke in this movie. There's more. So much more. So before you all start posting your comments down below saying, you forgot to talk about this, no, no. No, I did not forget. I just didn't want this review to be two hours long. Despite being under 90 minutes, the story was way too thin to fill the movie's runtime. The acting was subpar, but I don't think I would blame the actors for that. I honestly think their performances were as good as the script would allow. I will say one thing in the movie's favor, the musical numbers, while bizarre, are surprisingly well done but they weren't enough to save it from the wrath of the Golden Raspberry Foundation. It was nominated for seven awards and took home three. Worst screenplay, worst actor for Mike Myers, and worst picture. But was it really the worst picture of 2008? 
Well, let's look at the other Worst Picture nominees. First, we have Disaster Movie. And we can stop there because that's the worst one and it's not even close. Disaster Movie was a creation of Jason Friedberg and Aaron Seltzer, collectively known as Seltzerberg, and this may well be their worst collaboration. We are in Seltzerberg hell. Whoops, tautology! The title would suggest it's supposed to be a spoof of ridiculous and overblown disaster movies, which might actually be funny, but it barely touches that genre at all. Instead, it's a spoof of whatever random shit was relatively well known at the time, as is typical with Seltzerberg movies. High School Musical, Juno, The Chipmunks, Amy Winehouse, Miley Cyrus, and about two dozen other pop culture products and personalities are featured here, and even a few TV commercials which immediately dated this movie. Believe it or not, it even spoofs The Love Guru about two months after that came out, which should give you some idea of how much effort went into this movie. The most baffling inclusion is a spoof of Enchanted, which itself was already a spoof. What the hell is wrong with you, Seltzerberg? You can't spoof a spoof. That's a double negative. It's comedically ungrammatical. Racist jokes? Check. Homophobic jokes? Check. Gross out jokes? Check. Good jokes? Not a one. Terrible acting, no real plot to speak of, awful special effects, the only good thing about this movie is the title because at least it's truth in advertising. This is indeed a disaster. It was nominated for six Razzies and was jointly nominated for Worst Picture with Meet the Spartans, another Seltzerberg movie that came out the same year. Again, that should give you some idea of how much effort goes into these movies, but somehow it survived without a single award. Bullshit, I say. And yes, The Love Guru was a disaster as well. I hated it. But Disaster Movie was worse, and I'll tell you why. While The Love Guru is a bad movie, it is at least a movie. It has an actual plot. Not a good plot, mind you, but a coherent plot nonetheless. It has a story the audience can follow with a beginning, middle, and end. Disaster Movie does not. There's nothing coherent about this. It's just a string of incredibly bad sketches loosely strung together with no rhyme or reason. And that's not to say sketch movies can't work. They certainly can. Meaning of Life and Kentucky Fried Movie come to mind. But the thing is, those movies were funny. They were written by people who understand how jokes work. Disaster Movie was written by people who think references are jokes. And that's why I'm picking Disaster Movie as my worst movie of 2008. It's an absolute mess, and I cannot recommend watching it or The Love Guru, not even ironically, unless you want to not laugh for an hour and a half. Both movies are a complete waste of time. If you're going to watch a Worst Picture nominee from that year, watch The Happening. It's still bad, but at least you'll actually get some laughs out of it. And now we've come to a point where the next few Razzie winners are movies I've already covered on this show, so you can expect a few second looks in 2022. But first, we'll do something special for the holidays. Till next time, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. You're an idiot. Yes, I am!